So just to introduce John to then, you've got a few personal achievements to be proud of, uh, one of which being the first, the world's first disabled person to swim the International Ice Mile. Sounds a bit scary to me. And you now sit on the board of International Ice Swimming and you're working towards being the first disabled person to complete an Ironman as well as an Ice Mile. And even just saying that for somebody that isn't particularly a fan of the cold is making me shiver in my shoes this morning. So without further delay, John T, I'm going to hand over to you. I believe you're screen sharing already. And I'm going to let you get on with your presentation and uh, I'll mute myself accordingly. Thanks, Nat. And good morning, everyone. Um, as this is Zoom and I'm doing this from uh, an old quarry, there may be a slightly delay when I switch uh, the uh, presentation. So I, if I talk in a, in a funny uh, rhythm, that's the reason why. Um, when we tried this yesterday, there was, there was a bit of a delay. But as Natalie said, I'm John T. Warnikin. I'm head of the North uh, for Brooks McDonald's. And I sit on the board of the International Ice Swimming Association. Um, and I was the world's first disabled ice swimmer. And what, uh, what we decided we'd talk about is how I actually got to be really on the board of international ice swimming and to do the, the, the first ice mile from someone who's disabled. So what we're gonna sort of touch upon today is basically my background because it's always, um, and hopefully you can see that, uh, useful to see uh, where I've come from. What exactly did I do to myself? How I sort of get over my, uh, of, over the adversity and then sort of my future goals and challenges that I'm looking to do and then a bit about ice swimming uh, and what we're trying to do. And then I'll go on to the responsible investment. So uh, even though I may not sound like it, I'm a born and bred Yorkshireman, born in sunny Harrogate. Um, hopefully that slide's come up. You can see there's the no Harrogate well, Betty's Tea Rooms, uh, the War Memorial, and, and the, the picture at the top right is actually the building I was born in. Um, and so, I was at school, at prep school. I, I, I led, you know, uh, quite a charmed life. I have great parents, uh, great education. So I spent 10 years here at a school called Grosvenor House, uh, out in the countryside, up in Nidderdale. Had a fantastic time, ran wild and feral, some would say. Uh, and there's a picture of me at 13, capturing the first 15 and considerably bigger than most of my compatriots. Uh, rugby is a constant theme in this uh, presentation. So I had a great childhood. Um, at the age of 10, my parents decided to move to Papua New Guinea uh, for work. My dad got a job out there. And so by the age of 11, my brother, who's older than me by uh, 18 months, we could pretty much fly ourselves from Leeds all the way to Port Moresby in Papua New Guinea um, on our own. So we became quite independent and quite worldly at a, at a very early age. Um, the stories I can tell, talk about Papua New Guinea and, and the time we spent there will, will easily blow through an hour, let alone 40 minutes. But as a young, sort of arguably privileged white male, to go and uh, live in Papua New Guinea for three years, albeit schooling back in the UK, uh, had a significant impact on, well, not just me, but the, the rest of the family. Um, after prep school, I went to public school like a lot of uh, my friends did, and I, um, as a Catholic, went to Stonyhurst College in Lancashire. Uh, probably famous for two things. One, it was uh, Sherlock Holmes came from Stonyhurst. Tolkien wrote uh, quite a bit of the, um, the Hobbit and, and the Lord of the Rings about uh, the countryside around Stonyhurst. And for those of you slightly younger, maybe uh, it was the ladies, the girls' school in Three Men and Little Ladies. Needless to say, I had a fantastic time here, and I am still very close to most of my buddies from school. We still meet up regularly, and I had a fantastic time at Stonyhurst. To be honest, I didn't really concentrate a huge amount on my on my uh, academic education, um, because really, all I ever wanted to do was was sort of two things in my life and from the age of eight all I wanted to be was in the military and I wanted to fly and I didn't I wasn't particularly wedded to flying for the Royal Air Force as a fast jet pilot which I really quite fancied or 
when the army started uh, talking about getting Apache attack gunships, I, I really quite fancied uh, you know, that as an alternative as well. So I wasn't 100% wedded to the Royal Air Force. All I knew is I wanted to, to be in the military and I wanted to fly. The other thing I wanted to do was to play rugby for my country. And so from about the age of eight, my whole focus had been on those two, two things. Um, I wanted to be the best rugby player I could be. Luckily, going to Stonyhurst, we had a very good rugby side. We had a tradition of, of, of good rugby um, with multiple England Scottish players. Dick Greenwood, who some of you may know, Will Greenwood's son, was at the prep school. Dick taught there. Uh, Kieran Bracken, I played with Kieran. Um, and so, you know, I, I had the privilege of being able to be schooled in, you know, to, to a very high level. And so before the age of 18, and hopefully this slide has come up, um, I'd, got, I'd secured my place in the army. I'd had a cadetship with the Royal Air Force who said they would sponsor me through university. I was playing rugby at a very high level. Um, I got my pilot's license before my driving license, and I was a black belt in jiu-jitsu, um, all before I was 18. And so I thought, you know, I was pretty much on, on track with the life that I wanted to live. Um, I then went to university and to be honest, I didn't really go to study. I went to basically have three years away, you know, out of sort of male dominant uh, uh, institutions. And so I went to university just to really have a good time. And the regiment that I was looking to join uh, they said to me, just concentrate on my rugby and not, not to worry too much about my studies. For those that are interested, I did psychology with sociology and social anthropology. Uh, so, you know, quite a useful degree in, in what I do now. Um, and I didn't really spend a huge amount of time in this building, which I've been told is the library, um, because I was mostly spent my time either with the boys in the pub or with the boys in the gym uh, training for rugby. Uh, hopefully, uh, there's a picture of me playing uh, with the team at university, uh, playing uh, the, the rugby team. And of course, with where rugby teams play at university, it's a lot of fun and frolics uh, go with it. So I had a great time at university, met some really good pals. Uh, didn't do particularly well at chatting up the ladies, uh, but hey, such is life, can't be good at everything. And then I left university in 1993, and in 90, uh, late 93, I went to the Royal Military Academy, Santa. So I'd chosen to join the army instead of the RAF. Um, and that was the start of my career. And uh, there's a picture of me in my second term with some of my, uh, my pal Scooby, who's a Gurkha, who's now a colonel in the Nepalese army. And to me, Santa was something you just had to get through. But the problem that I had was I, I got constant injuries on my knees. And some may say it's from playing rugby from such an early age. Some may say it's because of the training. But I ended up being medically discharged in July 94, um, where I had no job. So everything I'd worked for had, had basically stopped. But I thought, well, even with dodgy knees, I may be able to continue with a flying career and maybe join the airlines and, and go down that route as a commercial pilot. But all I knew really was to do that took time. And at that stage, the industry wasn't massively recruiting on, on uh, cadetships. So I just needed to get a job. And so I looked around and one of the jobs I went for was to work for the PRU. And coming back from their job interview on the 29th of October, 94, in my lovely MGB Roaster, that's me in the green one, I hit a tree at 50 miles an hour. Um, which uh, was pretty uh, sudden. Um, and so that resulted in me spending six months in hospital. Uh, it's a picture of me, if you can see it, with my lovely goddaughter, Ellie. Um, I spent four months in, in Harrogate Hospital where they put me back together, they rebuilt both my legs, rebuilt my head. I had my head rebuilt, um, stitched bit, bits of me back together. But the problem that we had was that my left leg really never healed. And, and so I was transferred after about four months when the orthopedic consultants in Harrogate said they could do no more to St. James's Hospital in Leeds. Had a variety of tests um, over the 
the next couple of weeks and it, I was basically given a decision. You can have five operations over three years and we we're going to take bone from your, uh, your leg. We're going to take muscle and nerves from your back and we're going to swing it all into your, your bad leg. We're going to break it at the top, take the dead stuff out, put the new stuff in, fix it all together. It's going to take this length of time, these many operations, and I'll give you a 30% chance of feeling your foot or you can have it amputated. And I just said, take it off. Um, to me, it was a very much a intelligent decision, uh, a head decision rather than a heart decision, because if I made it a heart decision, I probably wouldn't have made that decision. Anyway, it transpires uh, that it was the right decision. I won't go into too many graphics. Uh, there are other stories to be told, probably not for this forum. Um, but I came out on my mother's 60, oh, my mother's 50th birthday, uh, missing my left leg below the knee. And that really was it for every sort of hope I've ever had of a career in flying and or rugby. It was all done. Um, so how do I get to, to from there to where I am today? Well, as I was lying in bed, um, these sort of things just came through my mind. So my big sort of postdoc concerns were, well, that's it. What am I going to do now with my life uh, from works? Because all I wanted to be was in the military and play rugby. Ditto with the sports and hobbies. Um, and then obviously, love, you know, will anyone find me attractive? I was very lucky that I, I started going out with a girl when I was in Harrogate Hospital, who I, who I knew previously. Um, but, you know, you know, I was 22. I didn't know how long that would last. Um, my mind, will I be okay? You know, post-traumatic stress and all of that was, was, was coming to the fore uh, that probably hadn't been understood uh, previously. But the one thing I did knew was I needed to, I knew I just had to get a job. My father had already always drilled into me it's easier to get a job whilst in a job so go and get a job and then that last line is when am i going to get the feeling back in that area is that when i went to the operation they didn't actually tell me they were going to give me an epidural in my back so i woke up and i couldn't feel anything below my navel which was a bit of disconcerting because i was like what have they taken off but thankfully all was well in that concern but i knew that Given that I couldn't leave the life that I'd hoped to live, I just wanted to live the best life as I could. Um, and I hope you, you can see a picture of my, my old garden down in Surrey. Um, and so that's really what I intended to build. And I didn't know how I was going to do it. I just knew that I wanted to do it. So I wanted to live the best life. And, and that involved earning, you know, um, a bit of money. So very kindly, the Prudential uh, said, you know, they, they would have me back after a year from the interview so I, I got a job as a financial consultant working for the PRU and it was probably the best thing I ever did in regards to career-wise it taught me so much um, I then got headhunted to go and work at Deloitte's uh, Deloitte, and Tu Deloitte and Touche in Leeds um, in their private client department which was just fantastic uh, again a fantastic jump learned so much and then I, I became more and more interested in investment management and then I worked for, for what was then BWD Rendsburgs in Leeds uh, now invest tech and after a while i decided that I, I i should go to london i had a my, my girlfriend at the time moved to germany she worked for deloitte and i went to work in the city and i had the choice of working for an established bank or going to work for a company called ansbacker which for those who may be old will know as the old henry ansbacker uh, private bank uh, they floated the stock uh, a lot of the football clubs um, and they had offices in the in the sort of traditional tax havens and one of the things we did at Ansbacker is we were the biggest lenders on super yachts outside of the united states and i ended up helping to build the wealth management division i designed the software that we used and i ended up running an internet the internet bank for fmb offshore because we were owned by the south africans at the time um and so at 28 i was in london i was doing a job that i found thoroughly engaging and i was getting on uh the the, the, the getting over the love all of that i got married to the lovely penny who has been my foundation and rock ever since right enough of the gushiness um and after the hands back had got sold to the qataris to qmb uh most of us left uh because they stopped us doing what we were doing and i set up a business with two people who i knew called genie capital where we built high risk structured products investing in leveraged currency and i can bore people to death about that uh, at another time but the other things we did, because once we had closed those funds and done the fundraise, is we had a lot of time. So we were starting to look at doing other things. 
one of the things was we we had the the rights to to do a film about a guy called Paddy Main, left, uh, Lieutenant Blair Paddy Main, who's one of the foundations of the current Special Forces. A, a really interesting character. I believe there's a series coming out about him fairly soon. And so we set up Third Bar Films right at the wrong time where, ta where, where the tax schemes on films had, had, had caused huge amounts of uh, issues with the industry and, and no one was actually investing in them anymore. And then things went bang uh, in 2008, nine, and I came back to Yorkshire for, mostly for personal reasons. My father-in-law had died, my parents weren't well, and my brother had been very ill uh, with depression. Um, and so I came back and I, and I worked for Sanlam, where I started off running the Harrogate office and then, then ran the north of England. And then a year ago and three days, I got headhunted to come and join Brooks. Um, and so I now look after the north uh, for Brooks McDonald, which I'm thoroughly enjoying. So my life now is, 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 is pretty good. You know, I have two lovely dogs, uh, Norfolk Terriers, who you may hear in the background. I get to swim on a regular basis in some beautiful parts of the, of the country. And that's, I live in, a, in an old quarry, which is why the signal may not be great. Um, and I also, because we've done all right, I've got a place in the south of France, which I have yet to get to, because we only just bought it before lockdown and I've yet to get there. Uh, and I can't go to my ski place in Colorado, which again, is slightly annoying. Um, so we're doing all right. And so how did we get to this is, well, I, I think, you know, as a simple Yorkshireman, I look at things that are in, about overcoming is that the first thing was that the responsibility lay on me to, to overcome. So I had to find a way to, to get through all of this. Um, driving around St. James's in my wheelchair when I was recovering, you would run into far, people far, more, far worse off than me. And so I, I realized actually I wasn't that badly, you know, bearing compared to a lot of other people in here. Um, I've come to say yes a lot, and we'll come back on that, which is probably not ideal if, if you're a woman, uh, certain things, but for a bloke, I do say yes a lot. I'm coupled with the, the, the mantra that I like to participate and not spectate. Uh, this has led me down certain paths, which is how I've ended up on the board of the International Ice Swimming Association. I also felt whilst I was lying in hospital, I had a responsibility to my family uh, to overcome this. And then there was a bit of pride and a bit of pig headedness to say, I'm not going to let everything that had happened to me and the fact that I'd lost everything I wanted to do, uh, you know, ruin my life because, you know, I just refused to let that happen. Um, but saying that, it doesn't mean I came out untouched. It did take me three years to go and watch uh, my local rugby team, Harrogate, play rugby. And I still slightly struggle with watching rugby. Um, and it's just, you know, because it, it's that unclosed door. It's that, that box that I will never sort of, you know, I, I, didn't, I didn't retire on my terms. And having spent all my life playing rugby at a high level with, you know, the likes of Kieran Bracken, Delalios and Will Greenwood and all of that, it's, you know, not to be able to see how far I could have gone, I do find quite frustrating still to this day. So when I say yes more than no, I view life um, a, a bit like, Monsters Inc. And for most of you, I would suspect, will have seen this film where the doors come and go and you can walk through doors. And I realized that everything, all the doors that were presented in front of me before my accident, and before I lost my leg, had now been sort of whisked away. And I had to take the, you know, the, I had a choice. I could either stand and look at the new doors that were presented to me and go through them, or I could be sort of think about what if and what if, and I don't do what ifs. So, I decided to go through them. And so what saying yes has done is I did the first three Help for Heroes bike rides just because I wanted to do them. I met a, a couple of pals who are in the Special Forces who we got on really well. and We've done some crazy stuff together. I was, did the Commando Speed March with them. We did a bike race around the Isle of Man chasing them. Um, and we become really good friends. Um, I went swimming with basking sharks off the northwest coast of Scotland. So hopefully you can see that slightly fuzzy picture of me in the water with a basking shark. And I learned to ski and I take my skiing really seriously and I want to be a good skier uh, who happens to be disabled and, and not just be a good disabled skier. And there, there are two runs that I, I've skied in Colorado. And then I got into open water swimming. I've opened water swim um, all my life. And when I moved back north, the the lake stayed open and we realized my coach realized that 
you know, I could swim without a wetsuit and there was this thing called the ice mile. So an ice mile, uh, as Natasha alluded to, is a one mile swim below five Celsius without a wetsuit. And back then, no disabled person had done it. And I decided I wanted to do it and be the world's first. So I trained and I did it. Uh, I actually swam 1.3 miles in 51 minutes. And it was probably one of the best days of my life. Uh, one of the most painful, but one of the best days. And there's a picture of me with the, the uh, second uh, disabled ice swimmer, uh, who I officiated at her ice mile, and a picture of me and my parents and getting in into the cold water. Those of you who have met me since will realise that I'm now half the man I used to be. Uh, I've always struggled with my weight post uh, army and post losing my leg. And effectively, ice swimming forces me to have medicals. And I kept failing my ice swimming medical because I was too heavy and fatty liver. And it's because of diet, not because of alcohol. And so three years ago, I was basically told I had to, I should consider gastric surgery, which I did. And so I lost uh, 11 stone uh, since my heaviest, which now makes the ice swimming uh, quite a bit more difficult or, or a challenge because obviously I don't have the fat or bioprene as it's known as the open water swimming world to keep me warm. Um, last year, we went uh, to, I went to the second world championships with the Great Britain team and there's a picture of me swimming uh, or just finishing swimming my race. I actually failed my medical pre the 1K race uh, because of a heart issue, which I will talk about in a minute. Uh, but in essence, we were there, we had uh, 40 odd countries with 400 odd swimmers swimming the 1K uh, in, a, in, a, in a swimming pool that you can see there that has been cut out of uh, blocks of ice in the middle of a lake in Murmansk in Russia. And the water temperature is sub zero uh, that we're swimming in. Um, and it was one of the great experiences um, that I've done, and I thoroughly recommend it. And then the, the thing that we always talk about about the ice is that we have ice smiles and, and ice tans, and, and that's no one is ever unhappy when they come out of the ice. So if you can see the three pictures of me, the one on the left is just finishing a 250 swim at the GB Championships in Cheltenham last year. Uh, that's more of a smile of relief than anything else. The one in the middle is swimming. Uh, I was swimming in Amsterdam on the 28th of December last year at the Amstel swim out in the, in, in the canals. And the one on the right is, is me coming back from my swim uh, in Mamans with my friend Caroline. So what's this year looking like or next year, given that everything has been pushed uh, forward? So as uh, Natasha said, I, I want to become the first disabled ice Ironman. So I booked to do an Ironman in Austria, which means I've got two half Ironmans to warm up. And then the craziest thing um, about lockdown is, for some reason, I've decided to try and do an extreme Ironman. So I'm going to Patagonia next December. It was supposed to be this December to do their extreme Ironman. And an extreme Ironman is, is the same sort of distances, but the territory is a lot harder. So for, for those that don't know about an Ironman, it's a 2.4 mile swim, followed by a 112 mile bike ride, followed by a marathon. And given that I've got pins in my ankle and running on a false leg, the, the, the marathon bit is, is a bit of a challenge. Um, and then this good friend of mine who I swim with, a uh, crazy grand lady, said I should come up to the Yukon to do that ultra marathon because you can do it on a bike or ski it. So I'm supposed to be going to the Yukon in February, which is now being moved to Sweden because of COVID, to do uh, a marathon at minus 50 with a view of then going out to the longer distances of 350 uh, kilometers. Uh, in subsequent years. And then I also recently uh, agreed to do a channel relay next year as well. And then after that, um, hopefully we've got uh, the World Championships, the delayed World Championships in 2020, which are now 2022 in ice swimming in Katowice in Poland. And then I'm doing a, a round jersey swim I've agreed to with a friend of mine as well. Um, and then just for a bit of fun, hopefully you can see these pictures. This is Corbett's Couloir in uh, up at Jackson Hole, the toughest sort of ski run in North America that's, that's monitored. And I'm hoping to go and ski that with some friends as soon as we can. Um, so ice swimming, just finishing off about ice swimming. Um, there's two parts of it. There's the adventure side, and this is the chairman Ram Barkai swimming in, 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 uh, in Antarctica. Uh, and there's quite a bit we do on, 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 on you know, environment and, and, and um, you know, uh, climate. 
So we have these adventure swims where people go off and, and just swim in very cold water and swim distance. The ice swimming is about distance. It's about swimming sort of a kilometer or a mile without wetsuits in really cold water. And then we have the racing. And so the race, our, our race distance, our statutory race distance is 1K. Um, but we also do a four by 250 meter relay, which is mixed. Um, and we hold the, the world championships every two years. And so some people come in and, and will just do the adventure, like to do the adventure swims and because swimming in beautiful environment and others are getting quite competitive. And if, and if you want to try and be the male world champion at 1K, in, uh, you have to be able to swim 1K in zero degrees in about 12 minutes. Uh, our current world champion swam the channel in under seven hours. So, you know, it's, it's really high class swimmers that are getting into this. And so moving on into, into uh, the environment side, you know, we notice things in the ice. Uh, you know, we, we're very close to, to, to water temperatures. And, and just to give you an illustration, I tend to train down at Hatfield near Doncaster. Three years ago, we had 10 weeks of, of, of water that was below five degrees, the magic five degrees that we need for ice. Two years ago, we had six weeks. And last, uh, last year, we didn't have one weekend where we could run an ice mile because the water temperature didn't drop below the magic five degrees. And so we're finding that the climate is getting, it's changing, which leads beautifully onto responsible investments that we have at Brooks. Um, and I think from my side of thing, having been in the investment industry uh, you know, a relatively long time now, is that we used to always have the green or ethical investments, which was all about do not do this, do not invest in this. Whereas today the, with the re responsible investment services and that Natalie touched on, there's things about supporting behavior rather than just screening out negative behavior. So you have this sort of two, two-fold way of doing things now, which is avoid, which is sort of the, what I would call the traditional method, and then advances, which is where we support behavior in businesses um, in order to, 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 to make that change at, at a corporate and, and global level. And at Brooks, we you know, have two ways you, people can access this. They can have, either have a bespoke portfolio built uh, down to their specific requirements and, 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 and what their view is on, on responsible and, and ethical investing. Or we have uh, a more off-the-shelf solution, uh, namely the managed portfolio service. So with that in mind, let's just look at the story about responsible uh, investment and, and what is the story. And, and you know, you'll have to have been living in a cage in, in, in central Russia to, to not realize that, um, you know, the green and ethical discussion is becoming more and more prevalent in what we do, uh, not just as investment professionals, but in, our, in every uh, uh, walk of our life. And we're seeing that there is a, you know, there is a global uh, um, emphasis now on we have to do things with the environment in mind. And for those who try and fudge it, you're going to get penalized, not just reputationally. You know, we, we're all aware of the Volkswagen being fined over a billion dollars, a uh, billion euros, sorry, by German state prosecutors, let alone what goes on in the States. You know, the, 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 the discussion of plastics, the David Attenborough uh, on, on plastics in the oceans, et cetera, et cetera. So this is, this is a theme that, that isn't going to go away. It's, it's not like, a, you know, a pick and mix of I want to be ethical or I don't which we, we sort of did in the past. This is becoming a central theme to everything that we do in, in regards to it in the investment management business. So to put it more into focus, so I just need to go back. We have different we're looking at and, and they've been driven not just by governments, non-governments into UN and the UN has this sustainable development goals which, as you can see there, I'm not going to go through them all, but that we really weren't talking about 15 years ago in the investment space. No poverty, zero hunger, um, sustainability, gender equality, all of those things have come, into, have come into, into the discussion piece in regards to how do we assess investments and whether they're appropriate for, for, for us as individuals, for us as a business and, and for our clients. And you can see that the responsible investment backdrop the, the amounts of money going into this are, are you know, are, are just growing and growing and growing. And not surprisingly, led by Europe and, 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 and the US, given that we are probably arguably the most, you know, the most mature of the investment markets. So, not surprisingly, there are slightly different ways and different styles that we can, we can, one can do this. 
we can do exclusionary screening, which is probably the more, what I would say is a more traditional, basically saying, I don't want to invest in this. There are ESG integration screens that you can see, so you can, you can look at the traditional financial analysts uh, and, and, and how you look at a stock or an investment and then throw an, an, an ESG screen alongside it to see how it then does or how that company does on regard to that. And then you can create best in class scoring themes. You can have specific thematic focuses as I want to invest in wind things or I want to invest in uh, battery technology. Or you can look at targeted ways or I want to invest in a company that invests in clean, cleaning the oceans of plastic. And all of these you can blend. It's like, you know, it's like any investment cake. You, you build the recipe to suit your, your own palate. And so going back to the, you know, the discussion, in the past, we would just do avoid. And the traditional ones to avoid were the armaments, tobacco, alcohol, gambling, and pornography. But in the more modern way is we also look at advancing. So we look at businesses that are sustainable. We look at people that's, that businesses that have strong corporate policies that have strong ESG output, that they're open and frank with their ESG responsibility. So you can actually go and analyze it. And sometimes, believe it or not, when you look at, if you, if you look more towards the advanced, some of the businesses that may be in a void actually do quite well in the advanced. Things like you know, BAE Systems, which is arguably a state-sponsored uh, armaments manufacturer, has, you know, has very good, uh, you know, no glass ceilings in regards to, to, to um, you know, men and women doing the same job, same pay and all of that. So if that's one of your criteria, you just need to be slightly mindful that companies may be fantastic at it, but then they may be in a sector that you may wish to avoid. So what we're trying to do is, is, to, is to create long-term risk-adjusted investment return, which is why people are employers. You know, you're going to invest money because you want to get investment returns with the objective that the secondary, or that the secondary but no less important objective to, to reflect the, the responsible investment values that, um, that people want to hold, our clients want to hold. But the, the way that we do this is, it, it isn't separate to our core centralized investment proposition, it just comes into it. And I suspect if I was delivering this, this uh, presentation in five years time, we wouldn't even be having this presentation because RIS will be central theme to everything that we do, not just as Brooke McDonald, but as an industry. RIS will just be part of it. So RIS will be the norm rather than, 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 than something you, you, you could do if you wish to do it, you don't have to do it. And we're seeing that a lot, a, a lot more with legislation coming in with responsibilities for trustees, pension trustees, and corporate trustees. And actually in our industry, the regulator is, is ensuring that we have to have a ESG conversation uh, conversation with our clients and it's it's documented on on you know on on the forms to, to make sure that we are discussing these issues uh, and it's and it's and it's at the front of the mind uh, when people are making their investment decisions so what Riz does in regards to into Brooks it's a central piece that just bolts into our central investment process into our buy list the asset all asset allocation uh, and so it's core to what what, what we do and I'm not going to go through this one uh, in, in huge amounts of detail, but there is a, you know, we can have a slight divergence with regards to this uh, with our services away from our, uh, our core, core asset allocation, um, but the divergences aren't massive. You know, it's plus or minus three, depending upon uh, that the sector, plus or minus five or plus or minus seven. So in essence, what we're trying to deliver is that core theme um that core performance that core brooks mcdonald way of doing things but with a with with an esg around it that works and and, and sometimes we need to diverge um uh, away from the core on asset allocation because we just can't find the investments there isn't that 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 menu of investments in that sector yet because of you know RIS and esg not not being uh, you know a, a relatively uh, new uh, theme to play so how does it work? It's very simple. The initial RIS screen when it comes to RIS is the first screen that, that we look at in regards to the investment universe. So let's put the RIS screen in first, then do the quantitative analyst, 
then look at uh, getting questionnaires done and then have the manager meeting and then put it to the investment committee to be, to be approved. And, and, and it's not just a through flow, that's a constant sort of circle of life. You know, we re review, review, take things out, put things in. Um, we use a common framework. We have a questionnaire so we can do qualitative, you know, company versus company, fund versus fund. So it's not just done on a whim of what mood I'm in or, or Ben Palmer who runs it. It's done on a, we ask these questions, we're asking the same questions so we can, we, can, we can make those judgment calls of which companies or which funds are doing what, what we want them to do or supporting the themes we want to support. Um, the thing is, this will not surprise many of you that we negatively screen for uh, in regards to RIS is alcohol, al armament, gambling, pornography and tobacco. And it's usually at this time I talk about the vice fund, which I won't do because uh, of time but that won't surprise many of you the negative screening ha has you know has been a constant um, what we're trying to do is we, what we want to support are things like ESG integration engagement thematic themes impact investing companies that are there trying to support waste management clearing up cleaning up the environment good gender practices you know no uh, glass ceilings for women um, reusable uh, technology reusable you know energy all of those things that won't probably surprise you are the things we're looking to support and so you know you can break these down into environmental energy climate change resource efficiency social healthcare. you know healthcare is a huge thing and i don't just mean with regards to covid but you know healthcare in the third world infrastructure making sure people have housing making sure people are educated and then looking at the governance, the board structure, the independence of that board, the corporate culture and accountability. You know, we've all probably worked in businesses where the corporate culture hasn't been to the standard to which we all probably uh, adhere ourselves to. And so being able to support themes that support what we believe is the right way of doing things, not that just benefits us and our clients, but benefits society and, and, and the wider world is, is very important. And so, Going on to this, because I've got a few minutes uh, left to spare, what this comes down to is clients can come and see us and they can, as I said, they can buy the off the, the, the sort of the, the easier packaged up thing, which, which is uh, the RIS on, on the managed platform service, or you can come and talk to, to, to Natasha and, 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 and the team at Horsons and say, look, I'm looking for a RIS bespoke for, these are the sorts of things I'm looking for, and they can then come and talk to us uh, about how how we can maybe fulfil uh, your your requirements and you know getting that blend of avoid and advance uh, you know to suit what you're trying to do you and your clients are trying to do and the interesting thing about RIS performance and I I went to a conference three years ago and it was the same there that when you throw RIS as an overlay in in, in analytics and and look and, and come with that sort of view. The performance of those companies that take it seriously has been out, you know, has been outstanding. And if you look at the risk performance here, uh, you will see that um, compared to sort of the standard industry uh, benchmarks, the outperformance uh, has been, you know, pretty substantial. Now, arguably, you could say, well, those the sectors that those risk companies operate in have been the popular ones recently, and we can debate that all day long. But it's just an interesting overflow that over over one, three, six months, a year, year to date, inception, the performance has been really, really quite outstanding. And then just finally, because then it's time for questions, a bit about uh, Brooks McDonald in Leeds. So Brooks McDonald moved its office from New York to Leeds. I took over running the north. Uh, we've got uh, Rachel Bannister, who heads up the team in Leeds. Uh, she uh, has done her level four RIS exam. Rachel Marsden uh, is investment director uh, in, in Leeds as well, also done her RIS exam. Uh, Rachel Bannister is currently on maternity leave, so Rachel is there doing it all. Will Clarkson's recently joined us. He's full, FC, um, he's full CFA qualified. Uh, and Ty Fair has joined us as a portfolio manager, again, full CFA qualified. And then we've got young Stephanie, who's our training investment manager, who joined us uh, this time last year uh, and has already done her CFA ESG investing certificate and is training up to be a portfolio manager. And we are then 
ably supported by our ad admin team uh, run by Chantel, uh, with Debbie and Shabina, who are very able at providing the service we want to provide. And then we have our business development team, who some of you may know, um, uh, young Craig, I don't know why I call him young Craig, uh, who, who's a Scotsman that seems to spend most of his time living in Yorkshire, and Chris, who assists Craig in everything we do. And that's it, really. It's a bit of a run through. Any questions? Thank you, John T. So we do have a question in from Craig. Um, so I'll just read it out. It says, how useful was studying psychology in terms of dealing with clients and intermediaries? I suppose really that kind of leads on to things like behavioral finance, doesn't it? Yeah, I, I think the study of psychology to do it is, use, is extremely useful. I think the problem that I had is I was studying, I did uh, specialized in sports psychology um, because I was interested in performance. But yeah, I mean, let's face it, the behavioral side of what we do and how we interact with each other is key. And, and no matter how technically advanced we all get, and you know, the thought of doing a, a presentation like this uh, two years ago, just, you know, probably wouldn't have entered our heads. It's still a people's business. It's still about relationships. It's still about interacting, listening, understanding, and, and being a person, a decent human being. And that's what psychology teaches you. Uh, yeah, and you can go into endless depths of it, but at the end of the day, you know, psychology and how and why people do things and understanding why people want to do things the way they want to do does help you to be a better consultant in probably whatever field you're consulting in. Yeah, so yeah, I thoroughly do. I just wanted to understand what made people tick. Basically, that's why I did it. Thank you. Now you've answered, I've got a question for you. You answered this slightly when uh, a few slides ago when you were talking about um, socially responsible investing becoming the norm. Do you think that that means that long term it won't be a service anymore and it will just be in fully integrated into the investment process? Yeah, I do. I think that's, I think, you know, you know, I always call this wrong, but I think five, it wouldn't surprise me within five years this is integrated. And we're finding within Brooks McDonald, because of the performance of some of the funds, that in, in, in a non, in our generic, you know, BP, uh, uh, bespoke service, the teams are putting in risk funds because they're really good. You know, they're really good returns. Um, yeah. and, and, and yes, you get that added benefit. And you also get that, going back to psychology, if a client or their advisor rings, you'd say, well, what about RIS? You know, my, my client's been reading about it in the Mail on Sunday or in the Saturday Times or whatever. You can say, well, actually, you've already got exposure because we're already putting this stuff in because it's good. You know, so, yeah, I just think it will become just a core of what we do, to be honest. Excellent. OK, so there's no more questions up to now, unless anyone's got any final ones and you want to bring yourself off mute. I'm conscious of time. I promised 45 minutes and John T, congratulations. You were bang on to the second um so if there's no more questions this is recorded uh, so by all means if you're chatting to other people going forward and you think um maybe that you want to uh, get them to listen to it it will be available um craig's just sent another question actually just before i um <laughs> take this up what's it say with your mad sporting events you seem easily led should we all be more the same way <laughs> yes <laughs> definitely <laughs> Say yes more, be led. It's it's great. People know, you know, people know what's what you might enjoy, even if you're too fearful to, to put your hand up. So yeah, do stuff that people say, I think you can do this. So come and I do think it. I'd like to say on behalf of everyone, I think you're you're an inspiration. I think what you've managed to overcome and how successful you've been, then uh, you know, you deserve you deserve all the good things that you've managed to create for yourself. You. Including you. a very beautiful wife, I might just want to say. Gorgeous picture. Um, so yes, yeah, so I'll, I'll let everyone check out and thank you for your time today, everybody. Um, again, oh, hold on, I have another, I have another question flying in. This is quite good. Um, I've got one from David. So how do traditional pension companies rate on this scale? So this is to do with social, social responsible. So you talked about trustees, didn't you, and things like that. Do you know, and, and I'm not saying this just because of the question. We have got a call today. I've got a call today with them about um, this very subject. I, I believe there's been some new um, trust, pension trustee regulations come out. Um, and I think it's going to be, you know, it, it, it's like we saw with, with when, when the, all the sort of trustee question, uh, trustee legislation came out. 
I think probably at the moment, the traditional pension trustees won't, won't necessarily have thought about it, but this is a train coming down the tracks quite quickly. And it will, again, everyone is going to have to look at this and go, okay, this is now a mandatory requirement that we've got to deal with and we better deal, deal with it. And what we're trying to do is just is to say, look, if you need, a, if you need some, some assistance, some guidance on, on how you fulfill these criteria, then you know, give us a shout via, you know, via, via UNAT. Uh, but you know, I, think, I, I think the trouble with when you put the word traditional by something, you know, the, the, the likelihood is that some of them won't have, you know, they, they, they won't take their head out of the sand, but it, it, is, it is coming. We are going to have to do this, everybody, I think. Another question for you, John T, uh, from Alan. Uh, have you touched base with the South African Arctic swimmer? I can't remember his name, he says. So Lewis Pugh. So Lewis. Yes, that's the one. So as, as a board member of the International Ice Swimming, our chairman is South African, guy called Rambakai, who is the picture of him diving in, uh, which we don't recommend, off the iceberg in, in the Antarctic. Yes, we know Lewis. <laughs> I can't say anything else. We know Lewis and Lewis knows that. <laughs> yeah. Lewis has a Lewis has a mission. He has a very valid mission. You know, let's let's be honest. Um, he has a very valid mission about clearing up the ocean. And it's absolutely true. It is some places where I've swum, you know, to put a northern expression, it's minging and it's pretty unpleasant. Um, so yeah. So Lewis goes to the Arctic. Um, he does things. He does things in a way that we wouldn't necessarily recommend. Wouldn't fulfil our safety brief, but <laughs> you know he's a good man for what he does and a tough, you know, tough guy, tough swimmer. I won't. I won't swim again. So he'll kick me. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> I've got. Uh... I've got another one from somebody oh. saying your story is inspiring, John T, which I think that is absolutely correct. Thank you. Okay, if there's, oh, hold on. If there's anything else. Oh, maybe, maybe you should do a nice mile. Who, Nat? I quite happily take you on a nice mile adventure, Nat. You know that. I'm not going. <laughs> I don't <laughs> like the cold. <laughs> I'd have to wear three wetsuits all in one go, I think. <laughs> and you're not allowed <laughs> to wear them, so that's me out. <laughs> But yes, thank you ever so much for your time today, John T. It's been a, a true Pleasure. inspiration. Congratulations and, uh, and thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to join thank us you. at this seminar. Thank you, John T. Thanks all. All right, take, take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.